You are listening to a Nerd Room Podcast, a member of the Star Wars Commonwealth Podcast Network. Be sure to check out more from the Star Wars Commonwealth on the web at StarWarsCommonwealth.com and take your first steps into a larger world. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Nerd Room MCU Retrospective Series, a 16-month look back into the Marvel Cinematic Universe leading into a weekend of release review of Avengers Infinity War. I'm on your host, Tim. I'm Troy. And I'm Sanjay. And this month, we're here to discuss Thor The Dark World, the eighth entry into the MCU and the second film in the Thor franchise. Now, this film stars Chris Hemsworth. Tom Hiddleston, Eric Eccleston, Stellan Skarsgård, Natalie Portman, Anthony Hopkins, Idris Elba, Rene Russo, and Kat Dennings, directed by Alan Taylor. Gentlemen, (laughs) you're back. I'm back, (laughs) and we're back at the retrospective table, and we're talking the second film in Phase 2 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, not the first. We've actually skipped over Iron Man 3 in light of some recent pushbacks in scheduling, but also to align a bit better with the release of Thor Ragnarok, which happens as this episode is dropping. So we wanted to get a review of Thor The Dark World out into the world so we can discuss the movie that came, not chronologically before Ragnarok, but in this franchise, to see how this has evolved from our initial review of Thor, now into Thor The Dark World, and then next week for our Thor Ragnarok review. So we're going to have the full spectrum of the Thor series within the next couple of weeks. How are you guys feeling? Feeling good. Feeling yeah. good. Yeah, it's good to be good to be here. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you guys are here. I've, I've made it back from China. Do you have any bootleg stuff to bring us? Like a bootleg Gucci wallet or... Bought some bootleg Lego. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, a few keychains. One, we'll discuss this all next week on the Nerd Room episode, but... Well, there's some interesting Yoda bootlegs that I did bring back as well. <laughs> nice. And while we're just briefly, I know this is way off topic, but we're just briefly talking Marvel and collectibles and that, I got to have a huge shout out to my dude, Corey from Tumbling Saber. He picked me up the Force Ghost Obi-Wan 6-inch Black Series, popped it in the mail today. It's going to be in the nerd room within the week. Corey, my man, thank you very much. I know you're listening. <laughs> I appreciate it like you'll never believe. That's awesome. <laughs> nice. Anyways, back to the retrospective episode, Thor The Dark World. Now, this is a film that I'd have to say, taking the poll from the room, probably, pre-watching this again, and taking the temperature of fandom, this is probably what I would consider the weakest MCU film going into this. And I think most of fandom would align with that. There seems to be an agreement among fandom that Iron Man 3 and Thor 2 were the weaker of Phase 2 and the weaker of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the stumbling block coming out of Avengers. Would you say that pre-watching this and pre-review that you guys kind of align with that thought? No, I I remember actually um, liking this movie a lot more before getting into this whole retrospective series. I remember (laughs) enjoying this film when I left the theater. and I remember liking this a lot more actually than Thor 1 in the first place. Uh, stay tuned. I don't know. It's, uh, it kind of changed. <laughs> kind of changed in 2017. You're showing here. your cards there a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I saw this in theaters with you, Tim. I believe. Yes. This is our first Marvel experience Date. together. Yeah. It was it Avengers or no? No. Uh, no. I didn't. See you Avengers are right. Yeah. Yeah. The dark world. Isn't that something? Yeah. And we started off with the worst, and it only got better from there. <laughs> I actually remember enjoying it um, after we saw it in theaters, and I'm gonna leave the rest of my review for the review that you're going to be listening to coming up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you guys. I came out of this, like we rolled out of Avengers and we kind of went into Iron Man 3, huge expectations, little bit of a let down there. And then we roll into Throw the Dark World not too long after, November of the same year. And coming up with a screaming success that was the Avengers, we had a lot riding on these individual franchises. How are they going to improve and how are they going to integrate what we saw in the Avengers? And I'm right there with you. I 
enjoyed this movie coming out of theaters. I didn't see maybe more of what I see here, at least in the first part of this movie, coming out of this. This is a relatively exciting film. There's a lot here. We get a lot of MCU universe building in here as well, which I really do enjoy. And I appreciate now more in hindsight because of what they're able to kind of insert into this leading forward into Guardians, which is coming out the following year, kind of giving some insight into the Infinity Stones and what Thanos could be chasing at this point in the MCU. So yeah, coming through all that, I, I really enjoyed this. It was a fun-ish movie. There's there's things and elements in this that I think coming into here, specifically Kat Denning's character, mm. that I was Darcy, that I was like, there's so much of this, like I hate this already. But as we go through this review, I was quite enlightened by the film itself because there wasn't much of her in this film actually. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I never actually leave in the theater, and that was my one problem with this film, was Darcy. I totally forgot about the character in Thor 1 at the time, way back yeah. in whatever year that came out. And then when I saw this movie, I was like, who is this Darcy character? And, and her jokes were just not hating with me. Mm -hmm. um, then obviously going back to this retrospective series, I do remember her from the first yeah. one. And I feel like I liked her a lot more in the first one than I do in this one. I, I felt the jokes weren't working for me at all in any level with all the characters i guess we'll get into that yeah. later yeah. on with this review though but yeah the reason i bring that up is because i find that as you go into films you haven't seen for a while you carry a certain stigma with them yes. right and this one in particular i think amongst fandom carries that stigma as being one of the weakest films yeah mm -hmm. and upon review I, I don't it may still be the one of the weakest films i kind of show my cards here a bit <laughs> but at the end of the day it's not a bad film i had no. this in my head as a bad film mm -hmm. like i like when i kind of look back and yeah i enjoyed it coming out but building through fandom all this time it's like okay thor the dark world's the worst the worst and it's it doesn't really deserve that i think no. reviewing and and coming back to these films has really enlightened me on what they were able to successfully do as they were building this universe we're still into phase two here the early part of phase two we didn't hit the ground running, I don't think, with Iron Man 3. And this one, you do see that stumbling, but it's after this, Guardians forward, that we've really had no issues with the majority of the MCU films. Which is Soldier. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah, the next that's year, Guardians and Winter Soldier, yeah. right? So yeah. it's, it's incredible what they've been able to do once they've looked back on what could be considered some of the weaker films that have a few more flaws in them. Well, the bad thing for Thor The Dark World is it's being compared against all the other MCU films. And they're all great. Yeah. So if it was being compared to, you know, I don't want to say this, but like the DC films, I think people would, not me, but I think public opinion, people would put Thor The Dark World probably somewhere in the middle of those. Yeah. And so the problem is they're going up against some of the best comic book movies of all time. Yeah. And like you said, it's it's coming right before Winter Soldier right. mm -hmm. and Guardians of the Galaxy, yes. which are two of the most highly praised films in the MCU, right. period. Right. And so you contrast that to Iron Man 3 and Throw the Dark World, there's there's a big divide there. Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, we have to rate these films based on their own merit. And yeah. I think that's why I'm really loving going back and reviewing all these is because it's given me a much fresher picture on these. And the hindsight of it all is making these things shine a lot more than I think I had kind of rolling around in my head pre rewatching these. Right. Because this isn't a particular film that I've come back to very many times. You know, it kicks around on TV once in a while, and I will revisit a few scenes, but I haven't sat down and actually rewatched this probably since I saw it in theaters. Yeah, I, I picked it up. I, I, I totally forgot that I actually owned it on Blu-ray, so <laughs> I, I, I know I liked it initially. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, funny enough, it's the only MCU film that I do not own a physical copy. Oh, wow. wow. I had to rent it off of iTunes to actually Crazy. watch it. <laughs> wow. That's... Yes, it's not on Netflix. No. Right. Yeah, yeah, Thor is, I think. Thor well, is, I think yeah. all of Phase 1 is. But yeah, Dark World isn't. Yeah, and the whole trilogy of Cap's on there. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah, so for whatever reason, the Dark World's on there. And that has nothing to do with the Disney thing either. Because no. no. if you look at the development of this film, this is the first film that came out purely under the Disney banner. Oh, Iron okay. Man 3 and Avengers were bought out by Disney. So you see the Disney logo there, but you also still see the Paramount logo. So they right. still cash a check from both of those films. That's the end of the Paramount deal was Iron Man 3. Thor The Dark World is Marvel Studios, Disney, period. There's none of this character or, or different studios or anything like that. This is funded by Disney, by Marvel Studios, and this is under that banner. So this is the first film of this new era of Disney and of Marvel. Wow. Interesting enough, this is one of the more expensive steelbooks that if you're trying to collect steelbooks and you're looking for Thor The Dark World, this thing will run you anywhere over 150, 200 bucks wow. to buy this on steelbook, which is pretty crazy. That I, is. Someone on Kijiji in Calgary, I just asked, you know, they were selling it. They're selling it for 140 
Wow. Yeah, for just this one movie, I still look, and I just can't justify. That's crazy. Well, I mean, going off the, the cover of the the Blu-ray and everything, and even the promotional art that we got, I really do like what they're going for. I think right. it's pretty epic. It's really cool. It's kind of what I wish DC was doing a little bit more of, but mm-hmm. I really do like the covers of what they're going for. I, I think uh, costume design looks great. Loki looks far better this time around. So does Thor with the armor and like the what is Cap wear again? <laughs> Original cap, <laughs> I, uh, iron, iron, chain oh, mail. Chain chain mail. mail. There, we there go. you go. You got to watch more Game of Thrones. <laughs> you know, I played too many RPGs. That's what it is. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I just like overall the costume design with this movie. Yeah, well, it's forward. interesting you bring that up because you see a lot of the elements from the director. I think Alan Taylor. Right. So it's interesting choice. He's coming off of several episodes of Game of Thrones, a lot of TV, not a lot of big budget production films underneath mm-hmm. his belt at this point in time. He did go on to do Terminator Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I liked it. I've been seeing it, so I have no comment on that. <laughs> but you see a lot of the Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones in here, and this yeah. I think is directly influenced by Alan Taylor himself. And we talked about an original retrospective of Thor how we found that Thor never found a footing, never found an identity. Was he this Arthurian character who's a bit more like the Kenneth Branagh, you're looking at like your Hamlets and these type of things, right? Or is he the Game of Thrones Thor that we see in this? Or is he the Taika Waititi that we're going to see, or Thor that we're going to see in Ragnarok? So it's about finding his footing. And that's, I think, where Thor continues, at least to this point, is that he has these individual almost character crises within his individual films. He finds his center in an Avengers film, but he has yet to grab that individualized character in the franchise. Because you look at each three of these films as we go through this, they're dramatically different, both in their color palette, Mm -hmm. their tone, their overall look and set design. So it's interesting how Thor is the one that I find that the consistency is not there. And that's something I want to get into with the character himself is because we are now going from... Thor to Avengers to the Dark World. So we have three iterations of Thor played by the same actor with three different directors and three different writers. Yeah. So let's. I want to talk about that as we get into this a little bit more about how we see Thor changing or maintaining the character because some of it comes down to the betrayal of Chris Hemsworth, but others come down to how and what situations he's put in. Yeah. Well, we all know who is uh, supposed to direct this. Yes. Originally. Patty Jenkins, Mm -hmm. Wonder Woman herself. Yeah. But she left over the banner of creative differences. Yeah. So even looking back into the MCU at this point in time, like we were talking about this almost constantly, it seems, with Star Wars, with Marvel, even with DC at times, Mm -hmm. is that the directors come and go almost as quickly as they change (laughs) their boxers. Yeah. (laughs) It's all about finding that fit. I mean, it looks like the new director, what's his name? Taika, Taika, Taika Waititi. Man, yeah. that's a that's a tongue twister. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like he one. finally cracked the code into making a good Thor movie based off the reviews. So, you know, going forward, I think they're going to stick with him. Like the Russo brothers cracked the code for Captain America. Right. You know, and uh, the first guy for Iron Man, John Favreau. Yeah. He did that for Iron Man. Yeah. Yeah. But not so much for Iron Man 2, I guess. Because <laughs> he did Iron Man 2 as well. But right? I guess he said there's a lot of studio interference. For sure. Mm-hmm. So we, we won't find out or we won't know what his original idea was yeah so maybe he did have a better iron man too possibly but i think the thing with the directors in the thor franchise itself and you mentioned this in our original retrospective is that thor is the only franchise that hasn't had a director return you look at russo's with cap Mm -hmm. you look at favreau with iron man thor three different directors wow you know avengers with joss whedon right you got the director of ant-man and the wasp coming back so you're seeing directors return to these projects when maybe they're given a bit more of that ability to kind of tell the story they want right where thor seems to have struggled in the early days with that actual definition of what this character is and i think the real struggle is finding that nice balance between earth and asgard because that was one of our biggest criticisms of thor was that we wanted more asgard we felt that the scale of the film went from this huge potential down to this one horse town in new mexico <laughs> right. all of a sudden like there's a dramatic shift in the scale of the movie yeah and this one has a tendency to lean a bit more on the larger scale but again at the end i find when we'll get into this of course you then squeeze back down trying to get back on earth so it's gonna be interesting to see how we look at this and then next week going to ragnarok because I think the scale of Ragnarok, at least from what I'm seeing on the trailers and that, seems like it's going to maintain this this large kind of overall scope of the narrative. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's interesting because we have obviously haven't seen uh, Ragnarok yet. No. But I would say I think so far Joss Whedon has been the best person to mm-hmm. you know portray um, the Thor that we all know. But 
I guess it's a little different too because it also has characters to play with like the Hulk and like Iron Man and all these other characters. But it looks like Taika Waititi is also playing off of that because we get yeah. Hulk again, we get Loki again, we got bigger heroes. I feel like um, Thor has had like the weaker cast of characters surrounding him at all yeah. times. So you don't really get the best stuff. I, I feel like Chris Hemworth eats up everything. I think he's great, but it just depends who's directing him. And we've seen that with um, Age of Ultron and we've seen that with Avengers that he can handle Thor, he can kill it. But he has the best villain. Loki has definitely been the best solo villain. And that's what and that's when I feel like the movies are at its best. Right. Avengers between him, uh Thor one, Thor two, that's when it's the yeah. best. Yeah. yeah. Do you find that even Loki outshines Thor? In this one? Chris Hemsworth. For sure. In yeah, this so one, absolutely. Like definitely. Difficult villain because you want more of him. And actually when they're in the process of producing this movie, they actually went back and added several scenes of just Loki. Oh really? Wow. So the scene at the very start where you see that kind of bridge between Avengers and Thor of the Dark World, where he comes before Odin and they kind of sentence him. Right. That was added. So you see Loki in this film even before you see Thor. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. And yeah. then what can be considered one of the best films, or best films, best scenes <laughs> in the film is the hallway scene with Loki, which was added almost at the 11th hour. Wow. And then one of the other scenes that Joss Whedon actually came in and rewrote for this film was another Loki scene. It was the scene when they're on the skiff riding through the Dark World or whatever. Love it. And that's a great scene. Yeah. yeah. So the strongest scenes in this film, most of them were added late in the day, and they all include Loki. Right. So the difficulty of having a villain that is... I didn't even know if you can consider him a villain. He's, no, of course, he's one, the ultimate villain. But he's also plays an anti-hero a bit in this film. Yeah. Right. So you, you're, you're asking for more Loki, and that kind of takes away from Thor. But I think that's also because, like you said, Troy, Thor doesn't have a strong cast of characters to banter with, to play off. He doesn't exactly. have a Mark Ruffalo's Hulk. Yeah. Right? He doesn't have a Captain America. Yeah, or an Iron Man, any yeah, of those guys. So yeah, so it's, it's hard because he has to – I think Hemsworth can own the screen. Yeah. But he needs also someone to kind of pull along the movie when he's not on it. Yes. And you don't really have that unless it's Loki. And that's when this movie, I agree, that's when it picks up is when Thor's off the screen and you have Loki on the screen. Yeah. yeah. Like he, he owns that. He sucks all that up, Tom Hiddleston. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So looking back at the overall box office, again, this is something that we love to revisit once yeah. in a while. Again, I give this flavor, this comparison of how this sits relative to the other MCU films. So Thor The Dark World, it, it came off the back end of Avengers. It had a bit of that bump. So the original Thor came in at $65 million for the opening weekend. Mm -hmm. This one came in at $85 million. Oh, okay. $20 million. That's a big jump. That's quite a jump. But you have to remember where the MCU was at when the original Thor came out relative to where it's at now or post-Avengers, I guess. At That's that point. true, yeah. So that $20 million bump pales in comparison to Iron Man 3's over $50 million <laughs> bump. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. yeah. So That's Iron Man 3 insane. coming right off the back end of avengers opened with 174 million dollars wow iron man 3 made 174 That's million crazy. in its so, opening weekend i guess he had four films at that point he was already a household name yeah. he's a huge hit in the event he's a huge hit pretty much well and that, film. that flew right off the back end yeah, of the of avengers, avengers right yeah and this one comes several almost a, not quite a year later or over a year later actually a year and a half later the november of 2013 so it's pretty stretched out it's a character that again people really really liked in the mm -hmm. Avengers, but it still was one of the kind of weaker debuts amongst the MCU films. This kind of ranks alongside of Doctor Strange, did about $85 million. Ant-Man did 57, so that's again a Ooh. kind of a jump down. But overall, this took in $206 million domestically. 206 or 60? 206. Oh. Yeah, so it actually ranks 12th among the 16 films that have debuted for overall domestic gross. Well, okay. Yeah, but then it did double that over again internationally, pulling in about $644 million internationally. Yeah, so it was post-Avengers that you saw the international halls for the MCU films start to double what you're getting domestically. Mm -hmm. If you go back and look at Iron Man, Iron Man 2, they're about equal, about 50% kind of came from each uh from globally and then also from domestically thor the dark world though got that huge international bump mm -hmm. from the name recognition that it got from avengers and then you open this up to this huge market now so yeah. you look at internationally that's where a lot of the money comes for these movies now is, oh yeah it's international grosses yeah especially china that country is just a huge market now for movies i mean some of the movies if you look at the top 10 grosses of the year i've never even heard of them but all the money is coming from china like, it's, it's like they'll yeah. do a hundred million dollars oh in, in a easily weekend, yeah which is crazy and that's why you see some of these movies particularly like transformers and that not particularly the mcu movies they they do cater a bit more to the chinese crowd because mm -hmm. that's becoming such a huge source of revenue 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then another thing that we like to do. So that's why you were in China, right? You're exactly pu you're right. pushing <laughs> Thor and Justice League, right? Yeah. Well, it's funny because uh, my wife texted me when I was there and said, "Oh, hey, guess what? The Justice League premiere in China was the night that you got there." Oh, you could have went. Yeah, I got a sweet line. We got we got to push this. We'll discuss this later. But she knows <laughs> someone that works for Gal Gadot. Really? Yeah. Anyways, that's you know here. So does there. she want to be on the podcast? That's exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we like to give a little bit of baseline here for reviews, and we use Rotten Tomato for that proxy. Again, we recognize that maybe the system is a bit flawed, but it does give you a reasonable foundation to go off of. So, this movie was rated at sixty six percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Certified fresh. Certified fresh. The original is rated at seventy seven. So this is the lowest rated Thor to date because at the moment, Ragnarok sits with 96% with over 100 reviews. So that ain't budging from that high 90s. This is That Ragnarok is the best reviewed Marvel film of all time on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. wow. So that's a huge step up from the second iteration of this character. You're almost getting 30% higher on Rotten, your <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes score, which is crazy. That's absolutely insane. I mean, I, that bump is like... From Batman and Robin to Batman Begins. <laughs> or The Dark Knight, even. Yeah, wow. I mean, 96%, I think, would be the highest rated superhero film it's of all there. time. And like I said, because it's got over 100 reviews, it's, it's you're, you're, you might get to 94, 95 by the time you get the majority of the American reviews in there. But it's not moving far off that. No. So, so depending on box office and already obviously the, the reviews it's been getting, do you think this could be the first MCU movie to break away from its chains and maybe potentially give us a fourth film? In the trilogy, do you think you oh, go further, or do you think absolutely you know, still stay true to it? Absolutely, I would love to see. I haven't seen Ragnarok, but if it's as good as people are saying, then absolutely keep going. I even think they should keep going with Iron Man and Cap. Like four Thor sounds good. Right? Yeah, Thor, four. Thor, yeah. Thor, Fastic Four. <laughs> I think if any franchise deserves a fourth movie, it's this one. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's. I really like Thor one. There's glimmers of hope and light in the dark world here. And if Ragnarok is as good as people are saying, I think continue with that character. Yeah. Because like we said, it's finding the footing of Thor and it's taken probably four movies to get there. Right. And maybe they finally found their path. We're going to review it next week, of course. Yeah. But I think it's time to get into a little bit more detail on Thor The Dark World. Cool. Let's do it. Now, where does this movie sit in the MCU timeline? Yes. It's a lot more jumbled than I had originally anticipated. <laughs> I just assumed, sure, it happens about a year after the Avengers. And that's kind of what we're going to roll with. But when you look at the preludes and tie-ins, so there's a two-issue comic book tie-in by Christopher Yost. And this is the prelude in itself happens right before the Avengers. Can explain some of the events of Loki being discovered alive by his mother, Frigga. And then it happens in between Avengers and the Dark World, kind of leading into this idea that the Nine Realms are in chaos with the Bifrost gone and all this. So originally Thor, according to these prelude books, yeah. was a year before the event. Oh, okay, before, before yeah. okay. Yeah. And now it was retconned with the, the comic book leading into the Avengers to be only days before in this Fury's big week. Right. And these prelude comics make you think that the Dark World isn't too far after the events of the Avengers. If you look at the very start of this film, we have Loki going up and talking to Odin. That gives you the impression that he's gone almost directly there from the Avengers, right? That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. if you, it's funny, because if you go into the second issue of this prelude comic, that scene is actually in here. So huh. they've taken what uh, presumably someone wrote, because I said that that scene was added quite late, right? They've taken the scene from in here, the most of the dialogue, and transformed it into the scene you see in Thor The Dark World. Oh. So it, Odin and Loki had the same conversation, if these comic books are meant to be canon. Right. They've had the same conversation twice in two different places. <laughs> 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 so that, that's, it, the MCU in itself is, is, you know, we praise it for the ability to build continuity, yeah. but there are holes in this. Because even if you look at the end of the film, when they're having breakfast, Darcy says, or she mentions... That Thor had left her for two years, right? Oh. Oh, I didn't even pick that up. Yeah, she Whoa. says last time he left for like two years. We don't know if he's coming back. Mm. When wow. she's all depressed again. Right. So again, that that gives you a weird time gap. Oh. So, yeah, because okay. she's ready to move on. I mean, she's dating that other guy from uh, Bridesmaids, like going on a date. Yeah, she's trying to at least. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, and in, I'm like, in these how books, do you move it shows her Thor? going to, to Norway, as it was mentioned in the Avengers briefly. Okay, yeah. She went that. to Norway. See the so, photo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. To see whatever, to study whatever. And that's when she sees him on TV and all this, right? 
But oh. the continuity of it all is a bit messed up because even if Thor is meant to happen a couple of days before the Avengers, you just look at the length of his hair. Yeah. It's short yeah. in Thor, yeah. and then days later it's long, and then what presumably could be days later it's even longer in here. Right. But I'm going to assume, we're going to assume, I think for this, given our baseline that we've established in the past as the incident or the Battle of New York being kind of our Battle of Yavin, I'm going to say this is about a year later, just, just because I feel like there's that scene with Loki and Odin, which could have happened right after Avengers. Then there's probably a big time gap because there has to be some assumption that Thor has been out fighting in the nine realms, right? Trying to bring peace to the galaxy because the Bifrost has been gone. So that's kind of in my head where I rattle around as this being as far as the MCU timeline. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Works for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the, I mean, I'm the guy with like X-Men where I see Logan and I'm like, that didn't make sense. Ah, let's just keep going. But Tim's the guy who he sees something in Logan and it doesn't make sense. And he, he takes quantum physics and he talks to uh, Stephen Hawking and he comes That's up with so a theory. Easy, <laughs> That's my problem. It's like, like continuity. Do, do you think Marvel has the same kind of story group as what Star Wars does, though? Because, I mean, obviously, if this uh, was Star so. Wars, this would not happen. No. Like, at all. Not a chance. Whereas I think Marvel, they're, especially around this time, too, right? With the Disney bio and whatnot, they're probably still pretty loose with their comic Well, they tie-ins. got Spider-Man Homecoming eight years later or something yeah. that didn't make sense. Up, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it seems like, I think we can assume that chronologically, these films happen in this order. Right. With the exception of Thor, Iron Man, and Hulk, which all happen at the same time. Yes. And you might be able to make a leap that Iron Man 3 and Thor of the Dark World happen at the same time. But I think in finite numbers, we can no longer rely on them because they don't make sense across the MCU. We just have to assume that Dark World comes after Avengers and before Age of Ultron. Yeah. Type thing, right? And th that's hard for me to admit, but I think reading these comic books and going through the details that are spoken within the individual films, it's hard to do finite numbers and land on dates. You almost have to just do sequentially when these are happening. Yeah. Well, Kevin Feige said uh, eventually they're going to come up with an official timeline. Now, in what format that's going to be, whether that'll be a book or something, I don't know. But he did say that they are going to come out with a finite timeline. When well, that is, I don't know. And if they want to call us to make it for him, we're there. Yeah. But it's going to require some adjustment to dates and retconning a few things. But it's more about the finite dates, not so much about the events themselves. Because all the referencing is in the right order. Mm -hmm. It's just like when you say two years here, a year there, six months, a month here. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't line up. But right. overall, the events kind of work in sort of a, a chronological timeline. Right. I spoke of prelude. So there are the two prelude comic books. And the other prelude, or not so much a prelude, it's a kind of uh, almost like an epilogue to Thor the Dark World, uh, more of a tie-in, I'll say, is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. actually picks oh. up a little thread from Thor the Dark World. Really? So as we're talking about tie-ins and all that, there's, I think it's the eighth episode in season one. It's called The Well. It picks up in the aftermath of the, the battle in London. Essentially, they show up and start picking up things, being like, oh, darn, Thor. Yeah. Do they see that monster that's running around at the end of that? Oh, no, yeah. Cool. Some other Asgardian stuff wandering yeah. around. And Lady Sif makes an appearance later okay. on in that season. So there are some more ties to Thor within Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. They're taking advantage of the individual movies. Yep. And this being one of the first ones out of the gate, they kind of took full advantage of the Dark Rod here. <laughs> Yeah. So to summarize all of this, I think I just wanted to step back and quickly look at our criticisms of the original Thor. I went back and re-listened to our retrospective episode there just to see where we were sitting kind of prior to this. And I know I've already mentioned a few things, but one of the things here that we, that we mentioned was scale. That was a big problem for us in Thor. We wanted to see more Asgard. We considered Thor to be one of the weaker links in the MCU. And like we've mentioned a couple of times here about finding the footing and finding the character of Thor within his universe, within his own kind of siloed off universe. We find that there's a lot of inconsistencies across from Thor to Avengers and even probably into this. So one thing I want to focus on here as we go through is to see if some of our issues or criticisms were addressed from the original Thor into the Dark World coming off of the back end of the Avengers. Now, with that being said, guys, I think it's time we get into the film itself. I don't know. I still want to talk about the promotional stuff. You do? What yeah. do you think of the movie posters? The movie posters were good. What about the action figures? Uh, was there action figures? Marvel oh, there's Select. small ones. Marvel Select was good. Yeah, Select. Yeah. Yeah. What was the food tie-ins? Uh, what was the commercials? I don't like? think those food tie-ins. Was beer. there sneakers? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one promo thing I will say, there was 
a trailer that has a line from Loki in it that I really remember. It's, you must be truly desperate yes. to come to me for help. Oh, I, remember I remember that. that. I yeah. remember okay. being like, wow, this is good. Cool. Yeah, cool. I remember that. Yeah. But that's the only thing I remember is the Loki promo. Yeah. yeah. Nothing else. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a Loki promo. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. There you go. <laughs> All right. So this film kicks off, like most Thor films, with a ton of exposition. In and the it's... land of darkness, there was darkness. And before that, more darkness. But before that, there was light, which was preset by darkness. <laughs> That's almost <laughs> verbatim what Odin says. And I think why is we jump right into one of the initial criticisms of this film. What the hell is all of this about? <laughs> it makes no sense. <laughs> before darkness, there was darkness. Well, yeah. <laughs> The, oh. So, the main thing I don't like coming out of the gates with the criticism here. I I love Odin narration. I love him speaking, and there's some really great stuff they used here for Infinity War trailers later on down the road. Right, not, not the Infinity War trailer, but ones that they've teased in the past. But he goes back way in time, millennia ago, and talks about Malekith and the Dark Elves and this idea of shutting off the lights. This this really, really throws me off because this whole first scene and this Odin narration sets up three things for this movie. And I'm going to say this right off the bat. This movie, this plot is all about devices of convenience. Absolutely. They set up things here to make people relevant, to make story elements like going between the realms easy. And it's all set up right here. And a lot of it, like I said, it's just purely for convenience. It doesn't really provide a good basis for a villain or a good basis for a film. Like I think there's the character elements here are great and they do certain things with this, this original kind of introduction of the villains, that what is an affinity stone and this idea of the convergence, but it's all there just to make the plot move forward. It's not, I, don't, I find there's like no organic growth to the plot outside of what the characters are able to build themselves. No, no. Yeah, no. I agree. I, I, I think it looks okay, though. It kind of has, like, that Lord of the Rings. I think the first Lord of the Very Rings. Very much kind so. Of, mm-hmm. No, I think we even said that about the first one, too. I think the Dark Elves look kind of cool, kind of interesting. Slightly oh, putty-like from Power Rangers. A little but bit. For okay. the most part, they're okay. A bit yeah. ominous with the eyes. I kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of like so. the, the, the true visual form of a faceless army. Yeah. Yeah. I never really got a grasp on their power levels, though. I was like, could they take down an Asgardian or are they weaker than an Asgardian? Right. You know, there was no real, like, like Malekith. I was like, is he stronger than Thor? Is he, he not? He kept running away every two seconds, yeah. which was really disappointing. He's like, yeah, I'm going to kill you, but I must rest now for, <laughs> for <laughs> like, a decade. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the thing, too. Like, you look at this battle at the start. Like you said, very Lord of the Rings-esque. Kind of cool at the start. Kind of mm-hmm. reminded me a bit of Wonder Woman and some of these other big battles that we've seen in Thor. So I'm fine with this. It had, yeah. it's, it's was very much like the i think in the third lord of the rings movie return of the king yeah, yeah. that first yeah. battle the story. it was exactly, exactly. that yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. but anyways it was cool to see king born i like seeing the asgardians fighting and all that but malekith in itself he seems to be awfully powerful being that he can wield an infinity stone because that was something that was made abundantly clear in guardians and this movie ties to guardians that it takes a certain type of individual to wield an infinity stone mm-hmm. and he seems to be able to do that with almost no issues right and so the power set of, of Malekith is somewhat undefined. I find they leave this character purposely ambiguous, but it's to a detriment of the character development himself because you just don't understand what he's able to do. Like he gets his ass kicked more or less by Frigga. Yeah. yeah. And it's only because Curse shows up later that it saves him. Like Thor beat the crap out of him. He doesn't really do much. No. no. He just kind of wanders around spewing nonsense. Like for me, the motivation of this character is non-existent yeah. like yeah. if you tell me that he wants to use the ether to turn or to destroy the universe like i never got the idea of an individual wanting to destroy and rule nothing yeah right like loki's no motivations sense. make sense yeah. i want to rule as a benevolent god mm-hmm. over top of the earthlings yeah right right he wants the throne like yeah. he wants Odin power says that, yeah everybody wants power mm-hmm. this guy wants to just turn everything off yeah which makes no sense. <laughs> well, he's always sleeping, so maybe he finally wants to get a good rest. I don't know. Yeah, that was another weird thing. Like, again, that was a way to... It's a convenience <laughs> thing. It's like, how do we get Malekith from this battle, which happened a millennia ago, to present day? Yeah. We make him sleep for yeah. a million years. That's how we explain his absence, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it doesn't make sense because he sleeps for 5,000 years, but then he still has modern technology. 
Oh, yeah. And I was like, wait, but I thought he's been sleeping for 5,000 years, so the elves have been keeping up? Like, it didn't make any sense to me. Well, I I guess the idea is that the elves were thought to be extinct. And they had kind of, because he killed all of them, including his wife and his kid. Yeah, yeah. But then they still had, like, an army of elves at the end. Yeah, they're all sleeping with them. Bunking (laughs) up. (laughs) But I do like the technology you used. I thought that was kind of cool, what you just brought up. The helmet technology. Yeah, all that kind of stuff I thought was pretty neat. Yeah, Yeah, it had had a feel of... It was it's quite modern looking, but it also had this feel of like it was a bit ancient. Just, exactly. It kind of looked like it was made of stone, less right. metal. Yeah. So it reminded me a little bit of Star Trek. Yes. The way the ships go and they're always like in the forests and stuff. It's very Star Trekian. Did you yeah. guys get that vibe? I did get that. Well yeah. now that you bring it up, I, I yeah. see that connection for sure. So sorry, I mean Star Wars. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're killing me. You're killing me. I'm gonna edit all that out now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we gotta join the Star Trek Commonwealth now. No. Wait, what? Are, what are they called? They're not the Commonwealth. There. We'll uh, we'll find it out later. What? <laughs> Star Trek. They have like not. They're not a Commonwealth. Trekkies. No, no, no. Okay, I'll figure this out later. <laughs> Come back to us next week <laughs> if you're allowed back. Yeah. <laughs> Live long and prosper, right? Yeah, you got to do it this. Not four fingers. I'm just held up a four. Five fingers. <laughs> I'm tired. Okay, guys, this is the best you're gonna get with me. Anyways, the second thing that was introduced on top of one of the main villains, Federation. Is... There we go. Yeah. Right on point, man. On point. <laughs> Very timely too. In my references. Right in. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, the ether. That was the second thing that was introduced in this opening monologue. Now, the interesting thing about all this, I'm gonna pull from different parts of the movie because. Like I said, they spent a lot of time explaining stuff here. And that shows to me the, the plot line of convenience is if you have to explain everything constantly throughout this, it means you haven't developed it enough in the film. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. But I like what they're able to introduce here with the ether. And they actually refer to it as a stone, as a relic. And this is the first instant in the MCU where we get the mention of some sort of stone or relic and this relationship to the infinity stones, which I think is really cool. And this one's a bit different. It's a bit viscous. It's kind of almost like a symbiote, almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I kind of like what they did with this. It's again, it's really contrived. This whole thing, <laughs> because later on they shove it inside of Jane Foster to make her relevant to the story. But I, I like the idea of them expanding on the Infinity Stones in this film, and this being the first time they kind of referencing why Thanos is around. We just had that end credit scene, and it's not until this movie that we get some idea of the Infinity Stones. Mm-hmm. Did you like kind of the inclusion and the kind of the explanation that they gave that Odin gave about that there are relics that predate the universe itself. So this picks up later in Guardians of the Galaxy and this adds to unknowingly that the Tesseract was the power stone okay, or whatever yeah. it is, space stone, sorry, and that we had the mind stone in Loki Scepter. So technically at this point in time, the MCU we had seen three infinity stones, but this is the first reference to one. And this turns out to be the reality stone, the ability to bend and pull reality to your own will. So I never really got that, like what, in fact, the ether does. Well, it's it's supposed to be the reality stone, but and so you can augment reality or, or force reality like into to your it. will, yeah, right. warp it to your will. But the hard part about that is that it doesn't really change reality; it's just destroying things. So yeah. I don't know if that's like a reality bend back to the darkness before the light that was dark. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's kind of again one of these things and. I don't have an issue with the MacGuffins in the MCU. I no. find that they're there and they've explained them nicely and, and kind of brought them all together with the Infinity Stone idea. But you need something like this in a film. I just don't like that it's kind of put into Jane to make her relevant to the plot. Mm-hmm. Because without that, she doesn't come to Asgard. She doesn't come on this journey with Thor. Yeah. Like you don't need her in this film. She has this air of Lois Lane for me in Batman vs. Superman. Had to get the reference in. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't gone through a podcast without referencing no, it. So. Always got to get it in. <laughs> <laughs> and she's not even in um, Ragnarok. No. And no. I don't think she's going to be back in Thor 4 or anything else. No, I'm so. sure she's referenced. I'm sure they must oh, reference yeah. her. But they had big issues, or she had big issues with Patty Jenkins departing. Yeah, that's the only reason why she signed yeah. on. I think she was forced back into this film. And you can really see that, I think. Yeah. Do you think they're going to recast? Mm, I think or they'll just, just drop the character. Drop the character. But she's such an important character. Doesn't she become Thor in the comics? She does. Yeah. Which is why I couldn't see them why they, why they would recast her. Or if not, you just make Valkyrie the next Thor. Yeah. Which would be cool. I mean, technically she was Thor in 
like a female Thor in the first place, Valkyrie. So yeah, much. I think you could go down that path. Yeah. But I'm not too heartbroken without Jane. I didn't no. think they needed her in this film. It's again a convenience thing to have her around. Yeah. But I like how that we got all the the kind of insight into the Infinity Stones here. I, 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 there's several quotes in here by Odin that they continue to use for Infinity War trailers, especially about there are relics that predate the universe itself. Like you see that in voiceovers when they're teasing Infinity War, right. and that's why I become very attached to that his few narration bits in this film the um the other thing that was introduced in this opening monologue sequence is the idea of the convergence so again another plot device that made it easy <laughs> for people to jump between earth and schwedraheim or whatever it's called <laughs> and jodenheim and jodenheim. all these different places right so it's it to me it doesn't do anything other than wake up malekith at one point and allow you to travel conveniently from place to place because the big criticism we had from thor was it was too earth centric it was too small mm -hmm. well this opens us up to the galaxy and here i am complaining about it <laughs> <laughs> what do you want <laughs> so i uh, could will you ever satisfy me maybe maybe not i don't know we'll see with ragnarok but i found that i just didn't like this plot device i just found it you didn't need it you could have just been on asgard like, I like the idea of visiting the other realms, but not yeah. for me. Not right now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because one of my weaker points with uh, the first Thor is the scale, right? It felt too small. I felt we were in two places um, only throughout the whole film. Uh, New Mexico and then obviously Asgard, like corridors of Asgard. Mm -hmm. This movie felt way bigger, which I was really grateful for. So, I mean, yeah, it's like... It's kind of like a, an easy way out with the with the was it the convergence? Convergence, yeah. But I do appreciate that we're going to different parts all over. We're going to London. We're going to different parts of the nine realms. And Asgard looks great. It looks bigger than ever. We yeah. get to see kind of actually like what Patty Jenkins did with uh, Themyscira. Absolutely. How yeah. we see the warriors training and all that stuff. We get to see that in this film, which I thought was really cool. And yeah. I'm glad we got to got those scenes. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Asgard looked terrific, and it looked majestic, and it, it was great to see it. Mm -hmm. But all the other places, I was just so confused because they all have like very weird names, and I was They're like, Scandic names. Yeah. <laughs> so is this Anaheim or what? And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Asgard Earth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, Jotunheim, right? <laughs> They're all end in Imes, yeah. and uh, yeah, so. I was just a little bit confused. This movie, to me, confused me, and this just added to it. <laughs> Maybe because I kind of was just like, I don't want to know what's going on, just because it's there's just so much stuff going on. Like, they fight in some place i don't know and then they leave back to go to the dark world that's the elves i can't remember well they fight in the dark world but then they fight like someone else where there's a big rock creature for like 10 seconds oh the seconds. forest oh, where we'll uh, one of his friends that. oh yeah. okay yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> well that's see that's the point of this is that the convergence in itself makes it confusing but when they go to the at the start of this film these different battles and all that when they go to the different realms i think that's good because that's that's that makes sense to me. Because the fallout from Thor was that the Bifrost was destroyed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from that, you get the nine realms exploding into chaos. Asgard isn't there to police them all. So. Oh, it, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Now. So that's why they're off fighting, and that's why Thor didn't go back to Earth. And after leaving the event or Earth from the Avengers, he's actually sent out to bring peace and justice. Right to the nine realms because it's been in chaos which i, mean, I like yeah i yeah. do oh, okay this, i like that better now yeah and this whole like opening battle sequence is cool because you you get to see the warriors three and lady sif and all that in battle together because that was what we said in thor too was that the only time that the warriors three and sif felt relevant is when they're fighting shoulder to shoulder mm -hmm. with thor and we get that right off the bat here which i really enjoyed this first sequence it's a bit of fun with thor you see them kind of it feels very much Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And these marauders that they're fighting and all that. It's a fun opening sequence. It's a fun battle to reintroduce you to the Asgardians. Yeah. Our, our first uh, DC Marvel crossover, I guess, because we now have Shazam. Oh, yeah. Film, that's right. right. So yeah. That was, uh, that was kind of cool. You know, it was really cool. I kind of felt like a like a Superman moment when Thor came down and kind oh, yeah. of like, you know, went up against mm -hmm. this big opposing rock monster and he just kind of swung his, his hammer cool. and took him out. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, it the thing too about that scene you say that he looks like superman yeah. there's so much posing oh yeah superhero yeah. posing Definitely. superhero this, especially landing. this opening sequence <laughs> yeah so much of it i will say though this movie would have been better for me if they had more of the warriors three especially lady sif she's terrific in this and seeing her in battle 
I know a lot of fans wanted her cast as Wonder Woman, yep. and if Patty Jenkins had directed this, maybe she would have been. Possibly. It's yeah. a very strong possibility because she's great in this. Yeah, you, you know, I didn't... I never liked the Warriors 3 very much in the first one. And I, I got to say still here that they felt flat. But I do like, is it uh, Alexander? What's her name? Uh, Jamie Alexander. I do like her. And I wish we got more of her and like get rid of Jane Foster and make more room for her. Because I thought she exactly. was cool. Yeah. But for the other characters, I didn't really care for like the, the Warriors 3. There's I feel like if they had flat. more to do, they just didn't have anything to do in this film. And that's why I said we need to get more of them. Oh, in okay. It. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the... This is good, this opening sequence. And also when they're escaping from Asgard. Mm -hmm. That part's great. They're, yeah. And it's yeah. great because you have the three of them doing something. Yeah. So it comes down to, again, what we said about Chris Hemsworth and not having anyone around him that's doing to, like, anything. gel with, really. Yeah. yeah. But when he's interacting with them, when he interacts with Heimdall, it's all good. Love that. But there's no time. It's like minutes in the movie where he's interacting with people like Jamie Alexander that is a stronger actress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're playing off Jane Foster, Natalie Portman the whole time, and she's a wet noodle. Yeah. yeah. And she's, a, she's an incredible actress, yeah. but the line she's getting, they're just not delivery oh, yeah and Idris Elba is an amazing actor so yeah. more of him and I think he's in Ragnarok yeah, a lot. I think, so. I think we're gonna get a bit more of him yeah. there which would be good he turns into Stringer Bell <laughs> <laughs> one thing this rock monster we spoke of this rock monster of Saturn actually these were first introduced in Journey to Mystery number 83 with Thor so that's a wow. cool callback cool. but an even cooler callback they're called Koran Warriors and we see the one here we see two of them actually in Guardians of the Galaxy volume 2 when cool. they're kind of bouncing around, um, Yoda, or Yondu and Rocket Raccoon, right. you see two of them fighting. And actually, you're going to see one of the most famous ones, Korg. I can't, if that's how you say his name. Oh, yeah. K-O-R-G. Waititi is playing. Yeah, Taco Waititi yeah. is playing this character. He's actually, he's from Planet Hulk, I believe. And he's in the arena with them. He cool. becomes an ally within there. So really? you see a nice continuity between this film, this, this rock monster that was first introduced, and they're going to show up briefly in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and you're going to see a, a speaking-lined character or one of these species in Thor Ragnarok. Nice. Yeah, so it's a nice kind of callback that ties a lot of this together. And it's cool because it comes from the original Thor comic book when he was first introduced. Nice. I'm glad I listened to the nerd rumor, so I wouldn't get all this great information. <laughs> so he's, it's, it's buried in history within Thor. So I really like that. <laughs> and it, it's a fun scene, too, when he kind of smacks him and he kind of looks at him. Uh, yeah, so uh, anyone else? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Drop the weapons. Yeah. That's, it's a good point here, actually, to talk more about Thor and Chris Hemsworth's portrayal of him. We've, we've, we've touched on this a bit briefly here, but what do you guys think about the continuity of characters? We have him in Thor 1. I really enjoyed his portrayal. Avengers, we all agreed that he was very well received in that. What do you guys think about a continuity character here? How do you think he comes from Avengers into this film? Do you think it's seamless or do you see a bit of variation within the character itself played by Chris Hemsworth? I think it's pretty choppy. Um, I still don't care that much for Thor 1, but I think Thor 1, we have a younger Thor who's a little more mature and he's kind of doing things his way. Yeah. But then he grows at the end of that movie, right? So we see that part and then Joss Whedon kills him. Like, he doesn't actually kill him, but, <laughs> you know, he knocks his character out of the park in Avengers. I think he's so good in Avengers how he interacts with Iron Man and Cap and, and Hulk. I think they do such a great job. And then this movie, I feel like they really tried to make him a lot darker, but it was very inconsistent. The tone of that character and it just didn't feel right for the thor that we've had from the last previous films even though those two are different from each other it just didn't gel with those ones so because you know you come off the heels of like a happy kind of fun funny you know thor in avengers one and then you get this thor and it just felt out of place and kind of a little he's kind of a little sour sometimes a little down and out and it just wasn't really working for me i'll tell you the problem right here with thor in this film the yeah. first part of this film it's because they've made him pine over Jane Foster. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. He, I, I, and I don't think it's deserved at all. No. Like, it's never earned in Thor 1, I don't think. No. Don't, only you don't get any of it like in week. Avengers. Yeah. Exactly. And now he's moping around after saving the Nine Realms, not celebrating, yeah. not going after Lady Sif. Yeah, Wonder Woman's all there. No, Wonder Woman. <laughs> she could have been. <laughs> <laughs> she's all there. Just like, come on. Yeah. She's, yeah. And, like, Sif makes, she makes a play for him at one point yeah. here, early on. And she makes this line, or she says this line about him focusing on one realm only. And you can see that in the character. So the portrayal is, is spot on, but I don't think it's justified in the character itself. And that's what really drags Thor down in the first part of this movie is because he's wandering around like a kid with a broken heart. Yeah. Yeah. And I just don't like it. Yeah. Even yeah. Odin's telling him, like, hey, yeah. get out there. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing, man? Exactly. You're Thor. <laughs> <laughs> to me, I, uh, 
I didn't notice too much, Thor, but you bring up good points, yeah. To me, it was Loki. The characterization of Loki is just so different from Avengers. You, When you have Avengers and he's t talking to humans like they're ants and he's a boot going to squash Love them, that. right? There's a great line. Yeah. But then in this one, he's sacrificing himself for Jane Foster. And you're like... Loki would never do that. Loki thinks of a human as an ant. Would you sacrifice yourself to save an ant? No. Well, my, my argument on that one, mm -hmm. and I, I was preempted by this by Sanjay <laughs> earlier today, would I have to say that it's all in context with Loki. If you look at his progression through Avengers and into this film, he's the same character coming out. Mm -hmm. And he's always got an end game. And I think that nobility and all that comes from the death of Frigga, his mother. Mm -hmm. He feels somewhat responsible for that. Whether it's that he wasn't there to protect her, he does blame that on Thor. But you can see that kind of inward blame that he's putting on himself. And you see him in the prison cell. He's all beat up about this thing, right? Yeah. So that really weighs heavy on him. And I think that that nobility and what he does there is justified because not only is there a means to an end, but he sees this as maybe a way of making up for his shortcoming with his mother. It's very clear that he has no care for Thor or his father, but his mother was his connection point. He had the magic of her mother, of his mother. Yeah. He had mm -hmm. that relationship with her. In these prelude comics even, it's her that discovers that he's alive after he fell into the cosmos. Oh. So they've always had oh. this connection point. And I think that's why Loki eventually does what he does. It's, like I said, an endgame plus this connection. So sense. I think it's justifiable what he does in this film itself. Because mm -hmm. we're going to see a little bit of that going to Ragnarok too, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they definitely changed the character. In Avengers, he was kind of scary, but he was also like jokey. And in this one here, he's just like an anti-hero. Like he's, you know, because he's so popular that, you know, it's, it's only... You know, it's only um, human nature to turn him into a hero. And I think they're in the process of doing that in this film instead of keeping him 100% villain. Because at the end, you're like, oh, Loki's kind of like fun, fun hearted and he's a good guy. Yeah, but at the end of this film, he clearly is imprisoned in his father somewhere and but taking the throne. That was just so <laughs> weird. I, it came out of nowhere. I was like, so where's his dad? Maybe his dad was what just like in the... Uh, put him in Odin's sleep probably. Or yeah, something. yeah gonna, maybe his dad was just in the John. I don't know. <laughs> we're going to get that in right now. They're going to talk about that. But... We'll get into a little bit more of, of Loki as we get further on here, but I think most of his actions, I think I'll, I'll like I'll defend Loki here almost to a dying breath. <laughs> if there's anything about this film that is wildly successful, it's Tom Hiddleston and Loki. Like when he's on the screen, he shines. And they added three scenes or beefed up three scenes with him in it for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I think th this is a good example of what additional scenes and reshoots can do to improve a movie. You take that bridge scene between Avengers and Throw the Dark World out, it's a, you're okay, but you like yeah. to see that continuity. You take out that hallway scene, mm -hmm. and there's a lot gone there, and you take out that skiff scene, or it's not written the same way, you lose a lot in that development of the relationship between Thor and Loki. Right. So it's, it's interesting that, that Loki was focused in on post-production as to getting this character in more after the success of the Avengers, plus people want to see more of this guy. Yeah. So it's, to me, it's justifiable. They do well at writing that character. Whereas Thor, eh, not so much until later on in the film. I don't mm. like this pining over Jane Foster. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> it bothers me a little bit. Poncho Thor. <laughs> he, it's like Poncho. raining. With, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of, of which, let's talk a little bit about our Earth-based characters. We do spend a little bit of time on Earth in Thor the Dark World. Not as much as we do in the original Thor, but we do have the return of Jane, Darcy, and Eric Zelvig. And what? the intern, right? And the intern. I'm just I don't even know what his right name yeah. is. Zero relevance to the plot. Yeah. Zero. Horrible. All it really gives is Darcy someone to play off a little bit. Yeah. That's why, again, plot device, it gives this character in Darcy someone to throw insults at. Yeah. That's and, all he's there for. And make out with. Yeah. True, at the end. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah, and he threw the keys in the other portal, so that way when they escaped oh that portal, then they yeah. could drive away. The worst. <laughs> Thor in a car. Like, I, I don't <laughs> mind those fish out of water scenes, but when your narrative is so poorly <laughs> constructed that you have to rely on some dude throwing keys into a hole that eventually show up later on the movie and get them back to Earth to save the planet... My God, <laughs> come on. Like, there's so much more so you could have done. So bad. That. Anyway, that... 
That's I have a huge issue with the, just the contrivances in this film. I like the film, but I like don't like how it's structured at all. I it think could it's have more been, the It could have been so much better. It could have been. There's a lot of good things in here. Mm-hmm. And even Darcy was someone that was okay in Thor, but this is one of the things that I remember hating when I first saw this film. Yeah. yeah. But at the end of the day, this realization I had about having a stigma about a film She's fine. Like, she's a pain in the ass, and she has a few okay lines, but to me, like, she's not relevant to the plot at all. No. Doesn't no. do anything, except for, like, corral Selvig eventually. Yeah. But just by pretending they're his kids? Yeah. Like, what kind of mental institution would just be like, yeah, sure, yeah, that's a kid's go. Makes sense. I'll sign you out to this person that doesn't know your name. Any ID? No, no, okay. That's fine. <laughs> all good. But she wasn't as bad. Like, I, I had this thing that she ruined the movie, but she was not that bad she's almost not present in this film as far as i'm concerned she's a contributing factor but she's not the main factor yeah like just she doesn't yeah as you said she doesn't add anything and all her lines like she goes into the restaurant to try to get jane foster back <laughs> you're just like what and then she's throwing the keys in and she's yeah there's just so much in here i'm not even gonna touch it she was she didn't work for me yeah, she didn't work for me at all. I remember, yeah, like you, I hated her scenes, every scene of hers in the first time I watched this on the big screen. And coming back to this, you know, she didn't bother me as much this time, but I was like, wow, is she ever unnecessary? Just just cut her. Like, none of her jokes were funny. None of them. Mm-hmm. And I think Chris, Chris Hemsworth is so funny. And it's a shame that he didn't get any of those lines, not her lines, but just some comedic <laughs> lines, because he's great on like that um that YouTube one they have where he was during Civil War. Yeah. He's yeah. hilarious. He's, he's funny in Avengers 1, Avengers 2. He looks like he's going to be funny in Ragnarok. And I just don't know why they even wasted their time on this no. this Darcy character. Like you said, to- was it turned down the Darcy? Yeah. Turned down the Darcy. <laughs> All the way on this Well, one. it's because he's Mopey Thor. <laughs> yeah. He can't be funny if he's got a dragon's hammer That's behind true. him, like a little... Kid. That's true, which I just don't understand why they they went that route in the first place. But yeah, I really I I, I don't like Darcy at all, and I I feel like you, you got the extra intern, you got Darcy in there as well. I just feel like those are two characters we really did not need in this film. What about Eric Zelvig? Now he was a big <laughs> yeah. character in Thor one, and yeah. he was a big character in, in Avengers. Avengers, and I thought his presence in Thor one was really great because they leveraged his Scandinavian heritage as to bringing some insight into the lore that was Thor and that was the Norse mythology, right? And I, I like that. He was a good character there. He provided a solid like scientific foundation for this movie that they were trying to bridge a gap between science and magic. Yeah. Really great. He was awesome in Avengers as well. He played the character that they needed in that, right? Yeah. That that bridge, that scientist that was producing the stability you needed for the Tesseract. In here, it's, it's kind of funny that he's gone crazy because Loki was in his head and he makes reference to that. But again, all he's here for is to further explain the convergence. If you have to keep explaining a plot device, there's something wrong. Like Odin explains it, Jane Foster explains it, Eric Zelvig explains it several times, including to Stan Lee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, that seriously. Was good, yeah. <laughs> if you need to explain something four or five times in a film, you have to rethink about what this device is and what it is actually accomplishing. Yeah. Well, again, I feel like this is this is a character they didn't really know what to do with after the events of Avengers. And I feel like you have Jane Foster, who's meant to be pretty damn intelligent. Why is she not just given more of this dialogue to chew? Like, why can't she be the brains of everything? But she's not. She, she's she's, yeah. she's, she's kind of dumbed down. She's a little schoolgirl. Yeah. Seriously, mm-hmm. pining over a dude. Yeah. Which makes yeah, no but, sense. And she's, yeah. she should be this brilliant scientist yes. that pushes forward with her research and, and it becomes this strong character that has relevance. Yep. Like, she should have had almost all, you're right, all of Zelvig's lines. Yeah. Not the crazy part of it, yeah. but just connecting the pieces like she did in Thor. Yeah. And being the Earth-based character that provides that, that grounding element to the film. But instead, she's left to wander around with the ether stuck inside of her right. and just kind of looking out with googly eyes at Thor. <laughs> He's no, pretty she's handsome. a good actress. Yeah. This is a, a strong character from the comic books. And this is someone that they could have really utilized in this film. But like I said before, and I repeat myself again, useless in this film. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm being no. really harsh on this film right now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, plan on this. <laughs> it's like, good, good, let the hatred flow through you. That was uh, a Star Wars reference. I know. <laughs> Sanjay, my <Mumbai. laughs> Tim looks so happy right now. Like, please. Like when your smile. kid rides a bike for the first time. <laughs> the one thing I will say about Selvig is, okay, so he's supposed to be crazy, yet he's figured out a way to stop the convergence, something that none of the Asgardians have done, and he does it with just metal spikes. Like... 
And again, man, don't <laughs> don't push on the buttons. <laughs> that made no sense to me. I was None like, what? Th- what are these metal spikes? I don't know. They're they're supposed to capture or kind of influence the convergence to a certain point. So they're that was my guess at it. To me, sure. I don't know what it was trying to induce or they're trying to prevent it. But again, it they spend so much time explaining this conversion stuff. And I just remember also Heimdall takes a shot at explaining it too. <laughs> <laughs> but we should play a drinking game. Every time there's exposition, take a shot. Oh, just purely the conversions. Give me more Infinity Stone stuff. I don't care if the world's aligning. It's, it kind of reminds me of, you know, when all the plants align, you get more gravity right. and everything, like the gravity increases. It's like that, but you can jump between the worlds. Who cares? Who really, like, <laughs> like all it does is wake up Mile Keith. Yeah. And, like, like anyways, convenience. <laughs> nuts. But anyways, speaking about Heimdall, this is a character that we get a little bit more dialogue than we did from Thor 1. Mm-hmm. And we also get a few action scenes with him. What are you guys' thoughts on Idris Elba as Heimdall in here? We even see him take off his helmet. Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, still underutilized. Um, yeah. He's obviously looks like he's going to be getting a lot more work in uh, Ragnarok. But man, anytime Idris Elba is on the screen, I think he, he just owns it. He kills it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When he's t- taking down that invisible ship. Yeah. Well, that's pretty badass. Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. I'll say that positive of the movie. Yeah. Idris Elba is always a positive. Yeah. Yeah, he puts good. his job on the line, too, for those guys to get out of there. Right? He's badass. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's here's something I'm going to throw on the table. More of a Thor Ragnarok prediction. Cool. After rewatching this movie, I am now convinced that the Soul Stone is stuck inside of Heimdall, whether it's his head or in his chest or wherever. His eyes, oh. right? Because his eyes can have yeah, a nice yeah. yeah. look. Because yeah. there's a line in here about him looking to the souls of the individual that is Jane, and he can actually see 10 trillion souls or whatever it is from his position uh, as the guard of the Bifrost. Mm-hmm. When you start talking like that, he's got this yellow tinge to his eyes yeah. or orange tinge. I'm thinking that he's the Soul Stone. Ooh. Ooh. That's going to be my Thor Ragnarok prediction because we're running out of films to introduce an Infinity Stone in. Right. And he's okay. the H too, right? He is the H. Heimdall yeah. fills out the Thanos theory. There we go. Oh, I like it. So like it's, it. it's a way to maybe, maybe that's what Hell is chasing. Maybe that's why we can have Asgard in Infinity War. I could really see Thanos ripping it out of, of Heimdall in Infinity War. She put it inside Darcy. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Rip it right at her. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I just meant it would be funny that if she was like turned out to be an infinity yeah, stone. The, the most important infinity yeah. stone is in Darcy. <laughs> she is the stone Ooh. of humor. Yeah. <laughs> but it is Heimdall that actually, when looking at Jane and keeping an eye on her for Thor, he loses sight of her because she's wandered into the convergence, which is conveniently wherever she is. <laughs> at the exact time that he's trying to lo- locate her. Yeah, so this is what eventually drives together Jane and Thor again. And they have this very nice moment in the rain or not in the rain. She kind of smacks him about a bit. Does, does he of, control the rain in that? Uh, he, they make, well, he controls lightning and thunder, so why not the rain? So he makes it extra mopey? <laughs> exactly. He's going around like Superman. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The only Superman quality he has is that awesome red cape. <laughs> yeah, and not smiling for the first half of this film. <laughs> He'll smile when you like his movie. <laughs> exactly. Well, we'll see in a couple weeks here. Just <laughs> anyway, Thor's mission after all of this, she gets the ether infused into her his mission becomes to save jane foster that's his sole outlook on life at this point in time is let's get the ether out of jane and sure that's fine she becomes the macguffin of the film she carries around the ether between the different realms eventually drives malkeith towards her so that in itself i don't love it but it serves a purpose i guess as far as driving the plot forward. We need to really start to ramp this up. And it's at this point in the movie, I find, I've done a lot of complaining here, I've done a lot of criticizing. But going forward here in the review, I find that it's it's here, once Thor takes Jane to Asgard, this is when the movie flips. And this is when it gets a bit more fun, this is when it gets a bit more exciting, because we get a lot more Loki in this. We get him in the prison with his mom, that scene Mm -hmm. in there, very great scene. And then we get the prison breakout. This is where a great action scene. I love what they do here. It's kind of funny that they don't check their prisoners. Yeah. <laughs> when they, they just put them in, in their full armor. I just, eh, just go and sit in there. Whatever. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but then, this is when we get the introduction. We've kind of got this concept at the early part of the 
the film when they did the original exposition. But this is when we get the introduction really of Curse. Now, this is a character from the comic books, and he's this big hulking mess. It's all practical, which is kind of cool. This doesn't cool. seem to be much of CGI there, if there is. Yeah. And he just creates a formidable foe that can go kind of hand-to-hand -hand with Thor. Mm -hmm. To me, throughout this, he's fine. He serves a purpose. He is probably a bit more of a badass than Malekith is. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he's just kind of there. And he's the one that incites this prison riot and leads to this fun scene, which does include the Warriors 3 as well. So does Malekith put some sort of stone inside another elf that turns him into this hulking dude? I can that he transforms, right? Like yeah, I didn't make so that he, up. Because we saw a curse before. Like there was like another guy that was like a curse. Yeah, so they He's... called him the cursed, and whatever this stone thing is, and they crush it, they become this like hulking beast. Pun intended. Um, <laughs> but he Malekith like he has his lieutenant or whatever that's yeah. with him at the start that goes to sleep with him wakes back <laughs> up with him that's they nice. kind of high five and then he says I'm willing to sacrifice myself so it looks like he like shoves it inside of him like into his ribs romantic yeah. relationship and then he it's pulls beautiful. it out crushes it and becomes this beast the cursed cursed yeah. huh. so it's it's a it, this scene for me it's a lot of fun it kind of really like I said really kicks off the film it kind of amps up the action we get Thor having some good lines interaction with the Warriors 3 and fighting which is where Thor needs to be he needs to be in that in the chaos I think to really thrive in this character yeah no it, it's pretty cool I, I forgot to mention earlier going into this film I gotta take my hat off to uh, the cinematography in this film looks mm -hmm. really good like visually this movie has improved so much mm -hmm. from the last Thor you know I was always complaining with like the, the bad Mortal Kombat uh, lightning <laughs> and for a guy being the god of thunder the thunder should look good but the, the that's thunder that's exact line <laughs> yeah. from a retrospective really <laughs> <laughs> But the lightning effects and everything just looks so much better this time around, which is great. So when we get to those action scenes, like you mentioned, with the break and all that stuff, it just looks so much better. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. That, that, that kind of actually nicely segues into the assault on Asgard. Right. Because that comes and falls out of this prison break, this initial kind of whatever you want to call yeah. it, within the prison. And then you get these huge ships arriving on Asgard. And you get this cool scene with Heimdall that you mentioned, Sanjay. Mm -hmm. But you see the big scale of Asgard here. This is the first time outside of that big opening shot that we get to see how big Asgard is. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like what you, they did here. It Absolutely. Is, the, the color palette is a bit toned down from... The original Thor. Yeah. It seems to be more of the Earth Tony, this gritty feel that you're getting from the director Alan Taylor coming out of Game of Thrones. Right. But at the same time, you're getting this this grand sense to Asgard, but their defense sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Not great. But tell me here, as a man that just watched The Phantom Menace and as someone that's quite familiar with it, did you get a real assault on Naboo type yeah, feel? From this? The, yeah. The Naboo corridors, even yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Absolutely, yeah. 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 It's just, and like them firing off the turrets and the, the size of the ships and the look of them. Yeah. They got this like real Battle of Naboo, yeah. N1 Starfighter type thing. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, yeah, like you said, the color palettes are a little bit darker, but for the most part, I could, I could see that Naboo battle going on there. Yeah, cool. Absolutely. Oh, we got Queen Amidala in there too. Exactly. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> Always got to come back to Star Wars. Yeah. Does Thor like sand though? That's the real question. <laughs> I love that that's one of your favorite lines. It's the best line in the whole trilogy. Thor clearly hates sand. <laughs> you see how pretty this man is? Yeah. <laughs> gets in his hair. Gets everywhere. He's too pretty for sand. <laughs> but the, the culmination of this battle, we do have one of the main ships that just so happened to be Malachi's ship penetrate into the main throne room in the main palace of Asgard. We have a nice battle here, and then Odin eventually shows up, kind of puts these guys to waste. But then this leads into what is probably one of the better sequences in this film, and that's the death of Frigga. Now, this character, this actress, is Rene Russo. She is a badass. Like, she slices and dices Malachi here. Like, he can't go one-on-one -on -one with no. her. No, he's losing. Yeah, he's very much so. And the death of her here, I, the reason I like this scene, not only because of the significance for Loki and significance for the actual plot, this is one of the better plot devices that they use for motivation because you see where this sets off Thor and Loki and Odin. This is a big moment. They're killing off not a big character, but they're killing off a significant character to the individuals here. And you can see how that's leveraged further on in the narrative and character development. But here, when you get to this funeral pyre scene, like the score really swells. It feels very much like Lord of the Rings, yeah. but it's kind of a real slowdown. You have this huge action piece. You have Malekith in here, kind of in the mix, almost getting killed. He's getting that big scar on the side of his face from Thor. Thor's up doing his thing. 
And then all of a sudden the movie just takes a brief pause. There's no dialogue. It's all in the score and all in this kind of this feeling. If you see it weighing in on Heimdall, he blames himself. Yeah. Loki, you see later on, he kind of does the thing where he squeezes his fists and the chairs yeah. go flying. Very powerful scene in here. Do you guys see that same thing? Yeah, this was great. I, I forgot. We actually got a death like this in the MCU at one point. Because at one point, we weren't really getting any deaths. We weren't really getting any risks, you know, or any stakes were involved. And here we got a, an important one. This character wasn't built up that much, but you got her presence around the whole yeah. franchise of the Thor films. So when they took her out, I wasn't seeing that at all. And when they did, I was like, oh, wow, they committed to that. And I, I thought it was a good payoff. And it really drives, you know, the Ford direction of, of Loki, yeah. which is what I really like. And on Thor, obviously. I felt like here you could even actually make the war, um, the movie a lot darker. This would set the tone for, for more uh, Poncho Thor and stuff like yeah. that to just really get a little more serious. <laughs> <and pretty. laughs> yeah. it's, it's one of the few intimate scenes in this film that I think is earned. Yes. Yeah. Whereas all the stuff with Thor and Jane Foster, not a chance. This stuff is good. Yeah. You bring up a good point, uh, Tim, when you mentioned the score. This score is probably the, my favorite score of any MCU film. I up agree. To date. It's yeah. good. It's really yeah, good. It's, good. it's, it's good. got the brass and it, make, it gives you the feels. I mean, this is a fantastic they, score. They use it at the right times. I find the first part of the film, it kind of blends into the background. Mm -hmm. But from here forward, it really amps up and it yeah. does a lot for me. It's the quiet moments that it brings up. But it's also the battle sequences that are underlain by it and kind of give you a bit of that uplift in it. Yeah, they did a really good job. I don't know who scored this. I'm going to look right now. I don't know. Does it say the score on the back of the DVD case? I don't think so. <laughs> I, think, I think we mentioned even Thor 1 had a pretty decent score. Yeah. So it's good that the, to see them continue. It's epic, right? It's, it's a richer score than you're getting in your Captain Americas yeah. and your Iron Mans. It's, it kind of plays a bit more to the character of Thor. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's, it's probably one of the best. Like, I still can't hum it. But no. like when it's on there, it's it means something to yeah. me. Mm -hmm. Like not nearly a level of a Star Wars score or anything no. like that. No, no. But like you said, this is one other thing that we've been kind of poking at through this retrospective series is the MCU doesn't have strong scores. But revisiting a few of these, yeah, you can say that there there are some of these that even though at the times, you know, we're really hammering on this film, but there is a really strong score here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So as we come out of this battle, we've got Frigga dead. Uh, Loki's still in prison. And they start to put together this plan. Now, Thor proposes this to Odin about baiting Malekith with Jane so he's able to extract the ether, and then Thor is going to destroy that. Odin doesn't really agree with this, and he imprisons Jane. Right. And <laughs> Thor takes a bit of exception to this, and he surmises this plan, along with the Warriors Three and Lady Sif, about extracting her and taking her off world to the Dark World to have Malekith perform the extraction of the ether. And with this, he needs to bring Loki back into the picture, which is the best part about this film. Yeah. <laughs> said it numerous times. Loki, how they bring him back in, I think is great. It feels organic. It makes sense. And there's a lot of banter in here that I really enjoy with the Warriors 3 and Loki and Thor and Loki about the lack of trust. If you, if you turn on him, I'll kill you. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. If you betray him is the word I was looking for. <laughs> if you betray him, I'll kill you. But... It is a lot of fun, and the the dialogue and how each individual character plays off of Loki really starts to elevate this film. And to me, this is it. This is the character that brings and makes this film way better. Like, I want more of Loki earlier on. I, I understand as far as the narrative goes, you maybe couldn't have done that. But once he enters here, it becomes a completely different movie for me. You mentioned a scene that I really love was when the Warriors 3 are helping to uh, capture Jane Foster. There's a scene between Lady Sith and Jane Foster where she looks at Jane Foster. Oh, like, yeah. the amount of shade given in that one look. So much shade. Just like, he's choosing you over me. Like, that was <laughs> fantastic acting. I love that scene. Yeah, they've teased that in two movies now, right? It's and it's I I I love that you're giving out Star Wars shoutouts here. But it's S I F, not S I T H. What did I say? Lady Sith. Well, yeah, because she's part of the Sith Rebellion. <laughs> the <laughs> Sith Rebellion. <laughs> That's the thing, right? What does that even mean? No. Oh, duh. Like, if you don't know what it means, Troy, I don't want to have to explain it to you. New Maybe you can. should go back and rewatch all of Star Wars. And I can, and then you'll know. Until then, your Star Wars membership has been suspended. Revoked. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, as Loki is able to move on from the Sith Rebellion, 
we we move into this brilliant hallway scene. This is something that I mentioned that was added late in the game, but has probably one of the best MCU cameos of all time. Yeah. Again, it's a Captain America cameo. How could I not love this? Yeah. yeah. But it's a lot of fun this So scene. good. I remember in the theater, we looked at each other like, oh my God, that was amazing. And the fact that it was Chris Evans too, it just wasn't like a weird reference to it. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Like I remember just eating this up. And this is, too, at a point in the film when you need a bit of levity, we've had that kind of darker Frigga moment. You're trying to see how Thor and Loki are playing off each other, how this is going to evolve. And you get just this really great scene. He turns into the guard and then Lady Sif and then Captain America. Like, it's it's awesome. And I love how he's just going on about some like the, the hardiness of, I can't remember exactly what he says. Yeah, it's going to be tight. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so tight. Yeah. Star Truth, Spangled Banner. Justice. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah brilliant stuff i i really really enjoyed this and it's at this point too when i think you probably get the best scene out of jane foster when she walks up and smokes loki and says yeah. that's for new york yeah and the look on tom hiddleston's face is just this smirk of like yes i got under your skin yeah that's what yeah. I needed. yeah right. oh, awesome yeah awesome. tom hiddleston's great yeah he just he, just annihilates it he kind of yeah. reminds me of the joker where he is that jokester character but then he can like turn it on and be evil and menacing yeah i love it oh yeah he flips back and forth yeah. throughout this whole movie and to me a lot of it's in tom hiddleston oh his yeah. ability to like convey that that like i said the nobility or that that mourning for his mother and then all of a sudden he turns around and just with a smirk he's all of a sudden that mischievous loki that we all know and love yeah. he's such a great actor i know he was up for the part of james bond they were talking about yeah, him taking right. over I just couldn't picture it because I just picture the long hair and the Loki-esque stuff. Yeah. And then I saw him in Kong and I'm like, okay, he's like a normal dude. He could be James <laughs> Bond. But I just can't picture him like playing normal roles. No, it's it's tough. Like he embodies this character. It's, to me, it's the smile and it's almost like his facial structure. Like it's so narrow. Yeah. Parts. yeah. He has like that perfect chin for yeah. Loki, right? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I think he originally tried out for Thor. Yeah, he, he did. did. Yeah. And he didn't get the part. So He's much better suited for Loki. Yeah. 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 He's yeah. too small for Thor. Well, you should be surprised what we yeah, can a little beef bit. Beef him on. up. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. we had that obligatory Chris Hensworth shirt off scene as well. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course every movie, did. yeah, had in a bathtub. Had to have, yeah, the, the bathtub <laughs> yeah. scene. We'll talk about that maybe a little later. <laughs> There's like, what, three Thor movies where he's having a bath in a row? He needs to have his shirt off. You don't put all that work in to not take your shirt off. Oh, he, he looks great. Like Chris Pratt, he'll do the same thing. Yeah, he did yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Both movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, Paul Wright even too, I yeah. think. Paul Wright. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> Anyways. We get to, we get into this talk every day. I don't know. Why. We always go shirtless with the guys. I don't know. It's so obvious. It's like this brute. Like he's just like washing up. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you haven't even been in battle that long. He's like, nope. Time for my daily bath. Yeah. Need to show off the muscle. He's huge, man. Oh, just good on him. Anyways, this. this isn't the shirtless hour. I think we've even made that joke. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Anyways, the escape from Asgard. Another really fun scene with the Warriors 3, with Lady Sif, with Loki and Thor, taking Jane Foster into this passageway that Loki has. They're utilizing his knowledge. And again, this comes back to what we said not time and time again in this review is when Hemsworth has strong characters to play off of, he is elevated. We see this again in this scene and also in the follow-on scene where he's on the skiff kind of riding through the dark world with Loki. Very intimate scene, very well done, levitates both characters. I'm just eating all of this up at this point. It's the, the escape scene, like riding around, shoving Loki, kind of the banter in the ship itself when he's trying to fly it and he's like oh you just took out your grandfather and you're yeah. running into things and loki kind of giving this running commentary on how poorly thor is doing with all this it's it's a lot of fun and it's probably one of my few favorite scenes in this movie yeah again yeah this is something the film definitely needed more of and i feel like this is the stuff that like taika was like eyeballing I, again i know we haven't seen ragnarok but i guess when you guys listen to this we will have by then Ooh, pretty time much, loop pretty yeah. close Trippy. but um i feel like he he was probably picking these kind of things from this film and inserting it into ragnarok because these are the highlights that we need yeah. and, and thor combined with loki is just so great the chemistry is perfect you really get that sense of their their brothers from you know they, they've grown up with each other and mm -hmm. um i really do like what they do here in this yeah. scene they recognize that that difference in their ideologies and, and just basically their foundation, their morality, all yeah. of it. And, but they acknowledge that 
but they also still have that connection to their mother. Yes. And they're kind of talking about that, that, you know, they both loved her and all this. And it, it's a nice moment. It's a nice calming moment, similar to what we got with Frigga. It, it, again, it's another very intimate moment that the score swells at too. That's really good. Mm-hmm. But that really leads to the dark world. So we do have this plan with Thor, with Loki, and the extraction of the ether from Jane Foster. So this goes forward in a nicely executed plan by Thor and Loki. They give them the impression that Thor, or sorry, that Loki has turned on Thor and actually stabs them. They kind of do this runaround thing. And then he cuts off his arm. And I remember this from San Diego Comic-Con 2013. I remember the trailer description coming out and people freaking out that Thor had his arm cut off. Very <laughs> reminiscent of a second film in a franchise, Empire Strikes Back-esque, right? And it was a cool way, probably to tease people, but I, I liked what they did here. I liked how this planned. And I know you had issues with it, Sanjay, because it seemed that, that Loki kind of flipped mm-hmm. kind of at this point and showed a bit more compassion for a human. Right. But I'm hoping that I was able to convince you a little bit as to why it's justified. What are your thoughts after we've gone through the majority of this film up until this point where you do see Thor and Loki kind of working together for kind of this greater goal? Yeah, when you bring that point up, it does make a little bit more sense that, you know, he's, I think in a way, he's kind of pretending, he's just trying to get what he wants, which is a throne. And I think he, th- you know, he's putting himself in danger, but I don't even know if that's really him. Like maybe it's just a hologram. So I think he's just toying with all of us and he's just trying to serve his own good. And he really does care about his mom. So I really do think that that's a part of it as well, that he wants revenge. So yeah, I'll buy it. Oh, I was, I always was on the team, uh, the cab. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was... You're always on team Tim, eh? I, I know how it is. Okay. That's fine. I, I, that's I fine. Also... No, no, no. Hold on. No backtrack. <laughs> I was always on the Loki camp. I always thought his motives were were very, I don't want to say necessarily clear, but I think by the time you finish this film, you see where his motives are. And I don't feel like he, he kind of plays the anti-hero for sure. But I always think he's been portrayed pretty well from going to Loki, Loki one, from Thor one to Avengers <laughs> one, or one to this film. I feel like it's been pretty clear where his motives are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. What did you think of the tease of his death? Like, did you, I guess it's hard to remember back, but did you actually think he was dead in this? Yeah, actually, yeah. I remember seeing it in theater and I was like, what? Like, they took out the mom and they took out Loki? This is crazy. And like, and Loki's like so well received. Everybody loves his character. Mm-hmm. Like, And I totally forgot about the hologram trick because he does it so often. But I was just like, whoa, they killed him. And at the very end, I was like, oh, frick, they got me. Well, there's <laughs> they got a me. scene that's <laughs> not too long actually after this, uh, the, this fake out of his death. Mm-hmm. It's the... You see the, the soldier stand up and you get this flicker of green. And right. Oh. It's, it's before even the, the Odin hologram. So there's a tease not too long after his actual death that that, in fact, wasn't him dying. Yeah, because I've never seen the guard talk to Odin. So but before that, when, oh, they, when, before the, that goal, when the guard yeah. stands up into frame, you see a flicker of green. Okay. It's very confusing. You're like, what is this guy? Yeah. it was Yeah. But it's funny because uh, we'll get to it at the end, but the guy almost looks like they CGI'd. Tom Hiddleston? Tom Hiddleston up. And they look like someone different. Just the way they got... I don't know if he's just mimicking Hiddleston or whatever, but right. it's pretty good. Cool. But he also gets Loki back actually before he dies there. He gets a cool fight sequence, like with the knives. Yeah. yeah. I see quite a bit of that in Ragnarok too. Yeah. And he's got this quick, nice yeah, kind of jabbing action. and all that. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. And you get a short fight sequence here between um, Thor and Curse and Thor and Malekith a little bit because he kind of just turns away and peels out. Again, I think that's the third time he bails. It is the third time. Because at the beginning <laughs> of the film, he bails. Yeah. And then he bails once the mom's been oh, killed. Yeah. And then he bails here. like To go to London. Jeez. He's got to go to the epicenter, which they randomly draw lines on a map. And it's just like, oh, Greenwich. Greenwich. And I'm like, where did these lines come from? <laughs> it's it's all the no relics, sense. Stonehenge and all this. I don't but, know. Oh, that was one of the, my biggest complaints. I was like, you just had a map of England and all of a sudden all the points that you just drew went through Greenwich. And it's down the road, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're in London. So, hey, it's right there. Eh, whatever. It's, well, yeah. Again, it comes down to... I don't know. Convenience. 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 <laughs> yeah. Go whoever convenience. wrote this, whoever's a screenwriter on this, must have a lot of convenience in their life. Well, it's... it's yeah, <laughs> I don't even know who wrote this. Watch well, is going to be the guy who wrote Justice League, and I'm going to have to defend him. <laughs> like, oh, this is a brilliant film. Well, this is awesome. Let me change everything. <laughs> but we get the, the death of Curse here, kind of in a cool way, from those gravity well things. Oh, that's cool. And 
we move to the, the final fight sequence and, and this idea of the convergence actually happening. The <laughs> Malachith, we're going to come back to him here. So he's a character that we spent almost no time talking about. He played, he's played by Christopher Eccleston, which I think is the ninth Doctor Who. So okay. at the time of his casting, people were quite excited about this. And he's he has got a lot of legacy in the Thor comic books. He kind of stems right back to one of the original Thor stories. He had that run with Jason Aaron recently in the Thor, the uh, God of Thunder. Oh, and he was really okay. good. And he is actually the one that chops off Thor's arm. So he had a good run there. But this character, man, he is not good no like this we talked about this whole film almost from start to finish and barely mentioned the main villain which i think in itself just tells you how poorly used this character actually was like there's no relevance here there's no motivation and there's no opposition to thor like you you never believe that he can go one-on-one -on -one, i guess until he's really full of the ether right. but at that point He's just trying to turn off the lights, man. Like, yeah. He's not yeah. Doing anything. And he already kind of checked out. I, I feel like he's probably the weakest villain we've ever had. I think he's he's lower than um than Ronan. And Ronan was was pretty weak, but at least we see more of Ronan's motivations or more, more of his motives. We see kind of who he's under, which is which is Thanos. And you, you get the press that Ronan's a badass. Like he can handle things, whereas Malekith, that's just like, oh man, just throwing the towel. At least, throwing the damn yeah, towel. At least Ronan was a badass until the dance off. Exactly, until the dance off. <laughs> You're right. The dance off killed me big time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely one of the weakest. And you bring up a good point about him being in the comics. Interesting enough, the story before Ragnarok, so I think it's like Thor issue 345 to 350 is a story. These numbers may be different, so don't quote me on this, but it's about Malekith. And then the very next story is Thor Ragnarok. Really? Yeah, so it's very interesting that they're continuing this on, this uh, thread. So I don't know... Malkith was first introduced in 344. Yeah. Wow, Good memory. Yeah. Jeez. And then after... I think it was 344. Walt Simonson. Yeah. 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 And then they have the Ragnarok run right after that. So wow. interesting enough that they chose Ragnarok right after this guy. And there's a lot of hype for this, as you said. The Dark Elves, you know, if they portrayed this really well, it would have been really cool to see. So, Something yeah. that would have been cool if they did this in like the 90s or 80s and they had Jim Henson puppets of elves. <laughs> of elf. elf. <laughs> well, I think what they could have done better with this character maybe is I, I almost see him somewhat of a, like a really twisted Joker or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, or some sort of odd offshoot of Loki. Just give me some motivation, like not just end yeah. the universe, as you say. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. Like at least like this is the thing that we've come back to once in a while here with the villains in the MCU. They're not always the strongest, but I find this one is the most ill-motivated. Like there's, I don't want to keep repeating it, but like even this last battle, as we get into it, it it's fun in parts. Like I like yeah. when Thor gets on the tube. Yeah. I, I like when he's kind of doing his thing, but again, that really, the best parts really don't involve much of Malachi. No. Yeah. Right. And then rolling through the convergence and how he actually dies. Like, it just all kind of nicely wraps up into a bow. <laughs> and you have the death of, of Malekith here. Yeah. And this really, again, scaled back battle. This is something we've come back to time and time again with the MCU. Is that the last battle doesn't live up to this big kind of crescendo at the end of a film. To this, this big climax. You don't get that. The middle stuff is the best stuff in this film. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. By the time you get to the end here, you feel like they're just trying to wrap it up again. Yeah. And we've we've criticized other movies for doing that, but this one is probably one of the worst for that. It's a one-on-one -on -one fight. You go from this massive Asgardian versus elves battle to start to this kind of great stuff with the prison break and the big scenes on Asgard down to the more intimate setting with Thor and Loki. And then you all of a sudden you just got this one-on-one -on -one battle with the humans running around in the background <laughs> turning knobs. Like literally turning knobs. And they're not even scared of the humans. They're taking videos of Thor on yeah. their cell phones. Like, okay, let's let's also look at this. So Jane and Eric Zelvig are running around whatever, Greenwich. Yeah. And there's these elves chasing them, shooting at them. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just meandering about. There's no oh, sense yeah. of urgency in the characters. No. There's n you never get the any stakes to this like anybody's in danger. Yeah. No. Like you never feel like the world is at stake. One of the questions always coming out of Avengers is 
why didn't Thor call the Avengers? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you why. Because there's no stakes here. None. <laughs> He's like, they're just elves, Iron Man. You take care of the president and uh, yeah. the Mandarin. I got this. Why do you need Iron Man or Captain America when you got Jane Foster and crazy old Eric Zelvig <laughs> taking care of her? And, and the intern, because the yeah. intern throws down that car. Oh, on yeah. Oh, yeah. Of elves. <laughs> and I was like, what? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. bad. Yeah. And the birds fly and they disappear. It's just... Uh, it's yeah, just it's inconsistent. I, I do like the fact that at least it was a little bit of a different... It was a, a different fight scene as opposed to like them teleporting all over the place. I thought that was kind of cool. That worked, yeah. You know, as yeah. opposed to like, you know, buildings are blowing up like crazy. Like we, we've seen that a thousand times in these superhero films. But Why'd you look at me when you said that? Are you referencing <laughs> a particular no, no, Superman I mean, film? Uh, well, we've seen it in fair share. I think they're 50-50. Marvel Cinematic Universe and the DCEU. I think they're pretty fair. Uh, split down the but i love that. that i don't know people seem to rag on those kind of things but to me that's part of the superhero movie trope is seeing these gods for lack of a better term battle it out in a modern setting no see you know what I'm, I'm taking it back to dragon ball i thought you know this is this is different but dragon ball z was always cool because goku these guys could blow up planets and they'd always be like let's take this to the field but that's boring so we're, not, we're not destroying any humans or any buildings we're gonna take it to the mountains that's boring and we're gonna blow up a bunch of mountains. Oh. i thought that's so cool and you still have the same effect you just you don't have any innocent bystanders but i love seeing like man of steel when they're going through like the building stuff and then like in this one they're going through i don't even know like a library yeah, yeah. the point of of being in cities is for the audience it provides a frame of reference and it, it gives you the stakes of what this battle could be mm -hmm. um, i don't disagree with that you could be wherever yeah. off in space having a battle in school yeah. but if you want to make the audience feel like there's some implications here you have to put human lives at stake you put alien lives at stake or whatever a faceless army you don't connect with that yeah but you you see that people oh i'm a bit scared but you never get any sense of urgency behind anyone no or stakes in this. And I think that's why this falls so flat is that it's just kind of over and the movie just kind of ends. You get the sequence with Thor turning down the throne to Odin yeah. and saying, I want to protect the nine realms, which is in itself is fine. We don't want to see Thor sitting on the throne. No. And we certainly don't want him not coming back to earth because we need him for Avengers and the follow on movies here. But at the end of the day, this movie ends, but it does end on a somewhat of a high note for me. You get, this battle, we can put that aside, but this great tease of Loki, mm -hmm. where he basically thanks Thor for not wanting to put up a fight for the throne, and he's sitting there with that giant smirk on his face, just chilling in the throne. Love it. This is where we leave Loki off, and this is where we're going to pick him up in Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, and the uh, the part that really got me was when Thor's like, do you want the hammer back? And Loki, knowing he can't lift the hammer, yeah. goes, no, you keep it, you keep it, you earned it. I love that. That's a great little yeah, uh, nod. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, man. That's it for Throw the Dark World. I didn't intend to come in and take this apart. You're swinging. But holy man. Did I... <laughs> You're, uh, what's that Irish guy, the boxer? Conor McGregor. Yeah, you Conor McGregor that. But then you kind of, you know, fourth round, you had no more steam left. And... Yeah. Well, yeah I, you know, <laughs> sorry, guys. I didn't really mean to take that apart this much, but it is what it is. Is, is this a DC film? <laughs> <laughs> Very well, it could be. You know what? At the end of the day, I did enjoy watching the film. But as you break it down a little more and you see some of the very obvious holes and the very obvious devices of convenience that I'll call them, or that I have called them, it, it bothers me more now than it did when I watched it. <laughs> so maybe sometimes the retrospect is always the best way. I should have just left it with hating Darcy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we are left on this film with two end credit scenes. One is fantastic. The other is absolutely brutal. Yeah. The first one is the Guardians of the Galaxy tease. We have Volstagg and Sif delivering and naming outright an infinity stone in the ether you cannot keep or it's not wise to keep two infinity stones so close together mm -hmm. in reference to the tesseract so again the first time both of those relics are actually name dropped as infinity stones pretty cool we get the introduction of benicio del toro and the collector in this as well right do you guys remember this when it dropped people were freaking out about how bad guardians was going to be <laughs> but no, I, I don't. I don't remember. Um, no, I've never. Yeah, I don't remember that. I've never, you know, obviously seen the um, the after credit, and I was blown away. I thought this was really cool, but I don't. Yeah, I don't. Remember if, that. if I'm remembering this correctly, and yeah. I, I might be wrong, but I think the director Alan Taylor made it very clear that he did not direct that final end credit scene. That was directed really? by James Gunn. Yeah. Oh wow! You want he, nothing to do with it? No, he separated himself from that. And in retrospect, it looks great. 
Yeah. It, it really captures the essence of the Guardians film. You yeah. see the cocoon in the background, which we all thought was Adam Warlock. Turns out not so much. We got kind of the answer to that in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. But I think it's a great segue, and it really started to connect those two franchises, which I think we're going to see a lot more of in Thor Ragnarok, which will benefit the film. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess I won't spoil anything. Yeah, no. I was going to say. <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I yeah, I'm talking me about, but I ain't going to say it. Yeah, no, we won't it. say it, but not gonna say it. in six months. You'll see. Um, or maybe in a couple of months you'll see. Yeah, who's, yeah. who knows. Um, yeah, to me, I remember... <laughs> <laughs> it'll all make sense in a bit. Yeah. I remember Guardians... It coming out, and I remember Tim, you were reading Guardians, or yeah. you were trying to pick up the books at I'd comic s- conventions. I started reading the 2008 run, um, and that which led me into Annihilation and all that before the move, just before the movie was announced, actually. Yeah, or and you, what, even maybe when there's rumblings of it, and I started thinking like, okay, this sounds like a cool concept. Yeah, because I had been following Mar- Marvel and DC since I was a kid, and I had not even heard of the Guardians, and you were the first one, and you were like banging that drum, like, this movie's gonna be insane, you should get the comics in early, and you were just like saying, this movie's gonna be great, and I didn't listen. And... Boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to tell you, but I'm right. <laughs> I was like, Guardians? This is a talking raccoon, this is gonna be stupid. I'm like, nope. oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> um, the second scene, I'm glad you feel that way. The second scene and credit scene we got here was the return of Thor to Earth to make out with Jane Foster. I have here in my notes, literally the worst. <laughs> well, sure. And the director takes full ownership for that? <laughs> yeah, yep. he should say James Gunn directed that he one. Should. <laughs> and then you get this Jodenheim monster yeah. strolling about, strutting his stuff. Because he was in the finale, was didn't he like pop in? No, he just was. Oh yeah, he Did jumped. Yeah, yeah, he right. jumped through. He comes like, to the convergence thing somehow. Yeah, yeah just yeah. jumps through that hole, man. Horrible. <laughs> there's no. Oh, there's no. There's no physics. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you just need metal poles. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <And> knobs. <laughs> let's wrap this up, guys. All right, <laughs> Troy, Sanjay, do you guys recommend Thor: The Dark World? Uh, I'd say in this day and age right now, I'd say no. I, I would say no because I think the MCU is so much better right now where it is. I feel like this movie just doesn't hold up. It really doesn't hold up whatsoever. Um, yeah, you get some Infinity Stone goodies in there. You get some decent action scenes. i say the best parts, obviously, is, is Loki. If you're a big fan of Loki, then don't skip out on this film because you're going to get some of his best portrayals. Um, other than that, though, I, I'm going to have to give it a pass. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree. Um, this movie is entertaining if you shut your brain off, but when you start lobbing logic bombs at it, it doesn't hold up. And it doesn't really add anything to the MCU. Like, there's no character introduction. There's no, you know, you have to watch this movie because it's the first time we get to see blank. It's just Thor's, it's not even Thor's first appearance. It's Thor's second appearance. Third. third yeah. Oh, yeah, third, yeah. See, even worse. <laughs> and... Uh, there's no connectivity to the rest of the MCU. It's kind of its own isolated. It's like if you're doing a um, tie-ins, if you're doing like an event comic, this would be like a tie-in that you buy hoping it would tie in. And then there's like a little scene and you're like, why did I waste four bucks on this piece? Yeah. Like, th- th- that's what this reminds event me of. Yeah, yeah, this is an event tie-in comic book. So That's, that's a great analogy, actually. <laughs> this is an event tie-in to the greater MCU. And it has nothing to even do with it. It's just like in the background, you see Captain America. That one little scene would be like, oh, see, we told you it would tie in. <laughs> there's relevance here. Yeah. <laughs> you know what, for me, I came into this episode, this review fully willing and wanting to recommend this film you were excited this uh morning i was yeah. and once i got thinking like as you said i really like your logic bomb there <laughs> <laughs> that's what tears this apart for me i find that because of the plot contrivances the the devices of convenience the ill-motivated and really poorly executed villain this makes this movie very hard to recommend amongst the rest of the MCU. Now, the stuff in there, the universe building that does, I think it's quite valuable, but you can get most of that exposition out of the Infinity War trailers. Yeah. The scene at the end with Loki, you kind of need that for Ragnarok. But at the end of the day, I think you'll get it in the absence of this film. Loki, to me, is the highlight of this. Hemsworth, when he has the right people to banter off with, is great. So nothing against Thor, nothing against Loki, everything against how this plot is devised, how this plot 
progresses and really what it does for the Thor character. It doesn't give him the right platform to grow. Mm-hmm. And for that, I'm going to say this is a, not a recommend for me either. Yeah. I'd yeah. say that you can really skip this in the overall progression of the MCU. I would, if you've seen it before, it's hard to say. I would say you want, you probably want to watch it, but don't revisit it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's yeah. the best way to yeah. put it is that you maybe need a single viewing out of this to appreciate some of the universe building it does, but there's no need to go back to this prior to Ragnarok. So there it is. That's probably one of the first MCU films that none of us have really recommended. Yeah. Well, even some of the other weaker ones like Incredible Hulk, there's still redeeming qualities where, you know, Samuel Jackson, Agent Fury meets and says you need to... Yeah, yeah. You part know, of a bigger universe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can see there's good spots in Incredible Hulk. There's good spots in this film, yeah. but it's not worth two and a half hours or two hours, whatever it is, going back in and revisiting this prior to running out and seeing Ragnarok. You don't need it. No, especially because Ragnarok looks terrific. So this is going to even look worse yeah. tomorrow after we Just see Ragnarok. It, yeah. yeah. It's going to be hard. Because we're going to, maybe that's why Ragnarok is getting such good reviews because everyone went back to watch this and then Ragnarok, they're like, oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> How do we prepare for it? Don't watch this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you prepare for Ragnarok? I don't even think you need to. I think it's kind of going to be its own standalone thing. Yeah, I think you I'd probably need so. the Avengers films. Maybe Age of yeah. Ultron to see why Hulk's in space. Oh, did I just spoil that? No. Well, <laughs> you know Hulk's in space. Anyway, <laughs> well, that's, a good, that's a good do. segue, actually, because all the films before Thor, before Ragnarok, probably aren't going to have much relevance on any of it. No. You get a little bit of Avengers because of his relationship with Hulk and some of the references they'll probably have in there. But is it going to leverage anything from before? Probably not. Or no. very, very little. And to the point where I'm assuming the director has written enough in there that you you get it. You don't need it. I'd still recommend Thor. Go watch it. It's a good film. Oh, yeah. Avengers, of course. And going forward, we'll see. But yeah, Dark World's out. You are up Thor Ragnarok. We usually do a prelude episode. This is kind of acting as that. But I want to get a few things onto the table before we go see Ragnarok and before we review it next week. So leading into Thor Ragnarok, you mentioned Hulk. He was in a Quinjet the last time we saw him. So they're going to have to have some sort of way of getting him up into space. My prediction is, is that the Grandmaster just comes and snatches him and says, we need you for this arena battle thing. Well, in the comics, doesn't Fan- uh, Mr. Fantastic, the, <laughs> the Black Illuminati. Panther, yeah, Namor. They fire him into space. We all thought this was going to happen at the end of Age of Ultron. Yeah. That they're going to just rocket him. But they kind of, they didn't do it. They just didn't commit to it. They kind of just sent him off. Right. Yeah. So it's just a bit of an ambiguous end. Yeah. And Thor, the last time we saw him was in Age of Ultron, if you don't include those little shorts. And he was rolling around in the bathtub. <laughs> Again. Again. <laughs> no shirt on. <laughs> and what that did, that pointed him towards the Infinity Stone. So he had departs Age of Ultron from the Avengers upstate residence in pursuit of understanding more of the Infinity Stones and why four of them have appeared in the last couple of years. That, again, is why I think we're going to see the Infinity Stone in Ragnarok. It makes sense. He's chasing the idea of it. And it's probably Heimdall. That's another prediction I'm going to throw on the table. So with that, we usually like to throw box office predictions on the table. And we've got one day, a couple hours, 12, 24 hours or something like that before this comes out. And about a weekend before, or I guess by Sunday, we'll know what this is taken in. So... Sanjay, what is your box office prediction for Thor Ragnarok? All right. Initially, before the positive reviews, I was in the 100 million range. But the positive reviews, I'm bumping it up to 130. Ooh. Ooh, Uh, I'm going to go 120. I'm going to go with a modest 106 million. Oh, Mm. really? I think the thing that hurts it is this was released around the world before North America. And I, Doesn't you know, that help it, do you think? I think that hurts it because when you release it in North America, because we're talking about just the North American box office. Yes. Group. Yeah. Yeah. So when you release it in North America, it's that excitement that's, you know, I'm the first person, one of the first people in the world to see this film. And as nerds, you know, that's important to me to be like, I got to see Justice League as soon as it's out. I got to see Thor Ragnarok as soon Avengers as it's out. Avengers was the same way. Though. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it oh. made $207 million. <laughs> Avengers <laughs> came out. Around so. the world before in North yeah, America? Yeah, a lot Europe, of MCU. I saw it in England like a week or two before. Yeah. Yeah. Really? <laughs> MCU films drop usually. Well, it would have made 300 if it was released in America first. <laughs> My point. My point is true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. It's been an absolute blast talking through the dark world, despite maybe some of the more highly critical points that were tossed onto the table. But nonetheless, <laughs> we're excited to go into Thor Ragnarok and decided to pursue through 
this retrospective series. We're going to be coming back to you guys with Thor Ragnarok and also next month, Iron Man 3. And that will finally catch us up from that month that we missed. And then we'll be rolling into the rest of Phase 2, which is exciting. We've got Winter Soldier, Guardians of the Galaxy, Age of Ultron, Ant-Man. So there's a lot of good films to still review. We're getting into what I would consider the best of the MCU going forward here. So cannot wait to review these. And we're going to be back, like I said, next week to review Thor Ragnarok. And if you guys have some thoughts on Thor The Dark World or Thor Ragnarok and you want to toss them to us, you can always grab us at thenerdrm at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Twitter. Our handle's at the end of the episode, except for Troy's because he changed his. <laughs> Good job. So <laughs> Troy? It it's uh, Troy the Lost Boy. Yeah. The yeah. Lost Boy? No 87. Or last. the Last. The Last Boy. Because I thought it was like a Lost Boy reference. <laughs> He's missing. <laughs> anyway, no, no, no. The movie, the vampire movie. He's also oh. The Last Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Let's go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows that. Everyone knows The Lost Boys movie. <laughs> you can also grab us on our Facebook or our YouTube pages. And you can always hit us up at the nerdroom.net contacts. We're in there. Also, go check us from the articles that we throw up once in a while over on the nerdroom.net. Just elaborating on some of the pieces we discuss in here and giving a little bit more context to some of the other thoughts that we have that we don't really cover here on the podcast. So, gentlemen, until next week when we're reviewing Thor Ragnarok, I will see you guys tomorrow at 7 o'clock up in your Sunjay's house. So I got to leave here at about 4. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think I feel every week for the podcast? <laughs> Shh, I don't think about that. I'm going to edit this now to have it out by tomorrow or later this evening. <laughs> so what you guys need to do is listen to this. Don't get your Ragnarok tickets. Actually, get your Ragnarok tickets because my prediction was the highest. And then listen to this before you go. <laughs> All right, guys. Until next week and then next or later on this month when we return with the retrospective series. I'm Tim. I'm Troy. And I'm Sanjay. This has been a Nerd Room Podcast production. You can find our hosts, Tim, Troy, and Sanjay, on Twitter at TheNerdRM, TroyTheBoy87, and Sanjabi. For more content from The Nerd Room, check out TheNerdRoom.net. And don't forget to subscribe to The Nerd Room on iTunes, Podbean, and YouTube. Be sure to head over to StarWarsCommonwealth.com to find more podcasts in the Star Wars Commonwealth Podcast Network, including Talk Star Wars, Tumbling Saber, Generation X-Wing, Rogue Squadron Podcast, Skyrim's Podcast, and San Diego Sabers. Follow the Star Wars Commonwealth on Twitter at SW Commonwealth and take your first steps into a larger world.